Does God exist? Are science and faith enemies? Your host for this series was an atheist who became a believer in God through his studies in science. Here is public high school teacher John Clayton. This particular lesson is one that is not easy for me to present. But I think we've reached a stage in this series of videos, if you've been watching from the first video on, where there's a need for me to share a little bit more about where I'm coming from. I would like to mention to you that we have this lesson in a little booklet, which is called Why I Left Atheism. And if you would like a copy of it, you can contact us and we'll be more than happy to send you one to read yourself or to share with someone else. As I tell you, in all honesty, if I had my druthers, I'd rather not ever present this lesson. I don't think any of us like to look back in our lives at a time when we've done some things and said some things, been a part of some things that we're not very proud of. But I have a reason for presenting this lesson every time I'm given an opportunity. When I first became a Christian, one of the elders in the congregation where I was worshiping came to me and he said, John, he said, nobody's totally useless. If you can't do anything else, you can at least serve as a bad example. <laughs> and I guess to some extent that's what I'm trying to do in this discussion. I want to ask you for the next 30 minutes or so to look at your own life. And I don't look at your maid or your child or your friend or your parent or your neighbor, but, but look at your own life and see if you don't find some things in your life that are similar to things that have been a part of my life. You know, I don't think we ever get so old and so wise that we don't have room to grow. And perhaps one of the best ways to grow is to profit by the mistakes that others have made. And so it's with that purpose and with that intent that I present this lesson to you this morning, not, not really as a testimonial. I would not want to be held to the literacy of this narrative. I wasn't taking notes as an atheist. The concepts I'm very sure about, and, and the concepts were what will be the most useful to you. You know, one of the things that I frequently run into is that I have religious people especially who will come to me and look at me rather skeptically and say, were you really an atheist? And the question is asked as if somehow someone like me is not supposed to exist. And I want to start out in this presentation by saying to you, without any question at all, that for the first 20 years of my life or thereabouts, I was totally and completely convinced there is no God. I believed it, I lived it, I had no doubt about it. And I think it's a mistake to assume that there's no such thing as an atheist. There are lots and lots of people in this world for lots and lots of different reasons that are genuinely and sincerely convinced that God does not exist. Now you might say to me at this point, well, why? Why are you an atheist? And right away, I've got something I'd like to encourage you to apply to your own life. I was an atheist, perhaps for you, the same reason that you're a believer in God today, if you are. Because I've been brainwashed. You see, my earliest recollection of anything related to God was my mother saying to me, do you really believe there's an old man floating around in the sky, zapping things into existence here upon the earth? Do you really think there's a hole I'll be dropped in and burned eternally if I don't live just the way some preacher thinks I ought to? Do you really think that building down on the corner full of all those hypocrites could be anything useful and functional called the church? You see, my mother and father were not believers in God. And I never questioned what my parents told me. And so by the time I was a ripe old age of eight, I was saying to people, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But before you condemn me too quickly, may I ask you if you're a believer in God today for the same reason? Do you believe in God because mommy and daddy believed in God? And when you really get right down to it, you never had any other choice. Or as one young man said to me one time, I believe in God because daddy will be the child of me if I don't. <laughs> that, 
That's no foundation of faith. God doesn't want a bunch of robots walking around regurgitating the traditions of their ancestors. God wants people who are intellectually and emotionally and mentally and psychologically and spiritually and every other way involved in their faith. Yeah, I, I had an inherited faith. What's the basis of yours? Do you really know why you believe what you believe? Now, if you've been watching all these videos that we have, you have been seeing up until this point a number of evidences for the existence of God and the credibility of Christianity. And I'm not going to repeat all that stuff. In future videos, we'll talk about some other questions like evolution and demonology and a lot of other peripheral issues, but they really don't have much to do with the existence of God. But what I'd like to share with you right now are the other things that happened to me, the more personal things. For one thing, a woman entered my life. A lot of things start that way, don't they? This young lady was by all means the most bullheaded, the most stubborn, the most cast iron willed individual I'd ever met in all my life. Now I can make all those derogatory statements because some seven years later or thereabouts I married her. But for the first time in my life, I ran into somebody who really stood for something, intellectually, morally, and otherwise. Now she couldn't answer my questions. I'd throw my best atheist argument at her, and she couldn't answer me. And then about three weeks later, when I'd forgotten the whole issue, she'd come back with some crazy Bible quotation I never heard of. It used to frustrate me no end. So I finally decided to put a stop to that nonsense. I'd had a Bible I'd stolen from a motel, and I decided to read it. Now, I wasn't going to learn anything. That wasn't my purpose. I just wanted to show her that nobody but a first-class idiot could believe that the Bible was anything more than myths and fairy tales. I'd never really read the Bible as an atheist. Oh, I had read parts of it to prove it wrong. I could quote whole sections I thought were especially stupid. But I had really never sat down and studied the Bible to see if it had any logic or any relevance or any value or any meaning to life. So I started reading. I had a notebook. I was going to write down all the dumb, stupid, idiotic mistakes that were in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I had decided I was going to write a book. The book was going to be called All the Stupidity of the Bible. I was going to make money. So I started reading. And over the next two or three or four weeks, I read the Bible through cover to cover. But I looked down at my notebook, and I didn't have anything written in my notebook. And I thought, oh, I must have read that too fast. So I went back, and I read the Bible again. During my sophomore year in college, I read the Bible through cover to cover, over three times, for the specific purpose of showing all the dumb, stupid, idiotic, scientific mistakes that were in the Bible. And at the end of that time, and to this day, I could not and cannot Find one single statement that I can stand on and say, look, here is an obvious, stupid mistake that proves the Bible was written by ignorant men living in an ignorant age. You got a scientific mistake in the Bible, I'd like for you to show it to me. I have challenged people throughout this country, throughout Canada, throughout Europe, to show me one single, solitary, academic, scientific mistake in the pages of God's Word. I don't believe it's there. But you know what was happening? I was beginning to realize that everything my mother had told me about God and everything that those guys on radio and television had said about the church were not at all what the Bible said about God or about the church. My mother said to me, God is an old man in the sky with a long white beard and big white flowing robes. Is that your concept of God? Have you created God in your image instead of the other way around? We spent quite a bit of time on that in an earlier video, and I don't want to belabor the point. But you know, even as an ignorant atheist, I could read things like God is a spirit, 
And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. Even I could read that and understand that God was not an old man in the sky. Even I could read things like, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. Flesh and blood didn't do it. But my Father who art in heaven. Even I could read that and understand that God was not a physical fleshly being. What, what's your concept? I began to recognize that the Christian life was not altruistic. You know, when I was a little kid, my mother used to say to me, now, if you ever become a Christian, you can't ever own anything. You can't ever take a vacation. You can't ever smile. You have to frown all the time, hunch over, hold your hands like this, and take little bitty steps. <laughs> well, I didn't want that kind of a life. But when I read the Bible, I didn't get that kind of a picture. I read passages like Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 28, where it talks about husbands loving their own wives. And it says, For no man ever yet hated his flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it. I read about the Ethiopian eunuch that went on his way rejoicing because he had found Jesus Christ. Have you got a callus on your chin from your Christianity? Has it been dragging the ground that much? That's not Christianity. Christianity is not a morbid, negative, miserable, confining, unhappy way of life. Christianity is a happy, free, joyous way of life. What's your concept? I began to recognize the hypocrisy was not confined to religion. <laughs> you know, as an atheist, I used to believe that every hypocrite in the world was in a church for you on Sunday morning. And that automatically meant anybody not in a church pew was not a hypocrite. <laughs> I know what changed my thinking on that. I had a buddy named Bill that used to work with me in organized atheism. Man, we were a good team. The cuss words I didn't know, he knew. The abusive arguments I didn't come up with, he used to come up with. Man, we used to chew them up and spit them out. And I came home on military leave one time, and the first thing I heard when I hit town was that old Bill was in the hospital. He had a ruptured appendix. He was in bad shape. So I went up to see him. And I opened the door of the hospital room, and I looked in, and there he was on his knees praying to God. Now, I'd almost been killed twice in the service. Never scared me into believing in God. So I stood at the door of that hospital room screaming at him, You hypocrite! You... You don't want to hear what I said. Until they forcibly dragged me out of that hospital room. And you know, I didn't understand it at the time. But I've gradually come to understand something that you may never have thought about. And that is that hypocrisy is a function of humanity, not religion. You deal with hypocrites at the filling station. You deal with hypocrites at the grocery store. You deal with hypocrites on the job. You deal with hypocrites at school. You deal with hypocrites on the golf course. Maybe more there than anywhere else. Now, now, you don't quit buying groceries because the grocer says one thing and does another, do you? You don't quit your job because your employer tells you to do something they themselves wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, do you? You don't deprive yourself or your child of a good education because a teacher teaches one thing and lives something else, do you? You don't quit playing golf because your buddy takes a stroke in the rough and doesn't count it when he thinks you didn't see it. Sure, there's hypocrisy in the church because there's human beings in the church. And any time you deal with human beings, you're going to deal with hypocrisy. You want to get away from hypocrisy? Dig yourself a 20-foot hole in the backyard, jump in the bottom, and let somebody cover you up with 10 feet of dirt, and even then, you'll be sitting down there in the bottom of that hole with one hypocrite. <laughs> there isn't a one of us breathing air that is as consistent as we ought to be. But the man or the woman or the boy or the girl that stands back and says, I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to get involved in the church. I'm not going to be active in God's belief. I, there's hypocrites in the church. I'm not going to be a part of that. My friend, you're just plain logically inconsistent. You don't use that kind of thinking anywhere else in your life. How in the world can you do it in your relationship to God? 
Well, during the time that all this is going on, I'm beginning to realize, well, maybe there is something to this God business, but all gods are the same. The Bible's not anything special, so I got a copy of every great religious book I could find. I got a copy of the Koran, I got a copy of the Vedas, I got a copy of the Saints of Buddha, the Zoroastrian tablets, the writings of Baha'u'llah. But you know, that didn't last a very long period of time because every mistake that I had expected to find in the Bible, I did find in these other religious books. And we've already discussed that in some of our previous videos, if you've been watching the whole series. And if not, you can go back and look at them. But all of a sudden, I, I had a conviction that, in fact, maybe it was the God of the Bible that we were talking about. But now I had another problem. Is anybody following the Bible? And so I started visiting every religious organization I could find. And in southern Indiana, where I lived at the time, that was a lot of churches. Now, I didn't know much about the Bible. Well, I thought I did, but it didn't. But I'd go up to a minister, and, I, and I'd open the Bible. I'd say, now, what do you think this passage means? And I'll almost get one or two kinds of answers to that question. They'd either say, well, let me tell you what the great scholar so-and-so said about that. And I'd say, thank you, and I'd leave. I've been confused with the so-called scholars long enough. Or they'd say, well, it doesn't mean what it says. Here's what it means. You know, I don't think God's an idiot. I think God can give us a book we can understand. Went up to one man one time, a minister. I said, what do you think this passage means? He looked me right straight in the eye. He said, oh, he said, we don't think in this church. Well, see, that's exactly the problem of organized religion that we have. And we've had people like Jim Jones and Marshall Applewaite and on and on down the lines, David Koresh, that have been able to do awful things because people weren't doing their own reading and their own studying. One day I happened to be going down 4th Street in Bloomington, Indiana. And I came to the corner of 4th and Lincoln Street, and on the northeast side of the intersection, there was an old, cruddy, broken down limestone building that had written across the top of it, The Church. And I had some friends that I knew went in that place, and they were, but I'm looking at that and I'm saying, well, what kind of egomaniacs we got here? And there were people going in and out of this building, and I caught a guy by the arm. I said, hey, what's the name of this denomination? He said, it's not a denomination. It's just the church. We're just trying to do what the Bible tells us to do. And I said, come on, don't give me that stuff, whatever you want to call it. What's the name of this outfit? And he said, hey, it's just the church. We're just following the Bible. I thought, well, that's pretty weird. Not too long after that, a friend of mine who was a member of that church took me to the services, and I never will forget my first experience at that church. The man that happened to be speaking that evening was a man by the name of Ray Muncy. Ray Muncy was a history department head at Harding University for many, many years. Great scholar, great preacher. But the first words that I ever heard and what I later learned was the church that's described in the Bible were these words. He stood up there and he said, now I want to tell you something. He said, don't you ever believe anything any preacher says. I thought, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. He went on, he said, don't you believe anything any elder bishop says? I thought, oh, this is getting better than that. He said, don't you believe anything anybody says in the name of religion unless you open the Bible and see that what is being said is right and consistent with what's written in the Bible. And I thought, <laughs> He doesn't mean that. So after services, I cornered him. Actually, I think I scared him a little bit because I was a pretty ugly-looking character at that point. Still am, but I was really ugly then. I opened the Bible, and I, and I said, now, what do you think this passage means? And he said, well, why don't you read it for me? So I read it. He said, now, what do you think that means? I told him what I thought it meant. He said, well, if that's what you think that means, it sure is what I do. And I said, how'd that happen? And I went to another passage. You know, he did that to me three times in a row. And I went out there that evening saying to myself, if I ever do become a Christian, that's the kind of Christian I'm going to be. The kind of Christian who won't believe something just because some great preacher tells me that's what I'm supposed to believe. 
The kind of Christian won't believe something just because that's what we've always taught about that. And you know something, if I understand the Bible correctly, that's something God expects of every one of us. Do you realize that one of these days you're going to stand before God just like I am? And if I might use an old Indiana basketball cliche on you, when that day comes, folks, it is going to be one on one. There isn't going to be any preacher standing over there spouting scripture for me or for you. There isn't going to be any elder or bishop standing over there saying, now, God, this one deserves special consideration. It's going to be me and God. It's going to be you and God. Why do you think we read things like work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Philippians 2 and verse 12. If what we're supposed to do is to listen to what some preacher says and regurgitate that. Why do you think we read things like study to show yourselves approved unto God? A workman that needed not to be ashamed rightly divided in the word of truth. If what we're supposed to do is to listen to some denominational tradition. And regurgitate that. My advice to you is don't believe you anything I say. Don't believe anything anybody says. In the name of religion, unless you open the Bible and see that what is being said is right and consistent with what's written in the pages of the Bible. Now that was a long, long time before I became a Christian, but it had a real impact on my life. And I think one of the great problems in today's religious world is that people have hired other people to do their biblical study for them. We go to church because we want to be entertained instead of participating. We really haven't understood the concept of developing a relationship with God. And we especially have not seen what marvelous, beautiful things. Having that relationship with God and engaging in that worship and being a part of the church can do actively in our lives. And so in the next video, I'd like to share with you the straw that broke this camel's back and how it led me to find what I believe is the true church. Does God Exist is an educational program which attempts to provide evidence that man can logically believe in God and that the Christian system presented in the New Testament is the best option for successful living. We offer materials free and on loan. Contact us by mail, fax, or email for a catalog to request materials or just to ask questions. Does God exist may be the most important question you will ever ask.